The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. Let's go to Hebrews. Hebrews 8, chapter 1 through 5. We're going to study Hebrews 8, 9, and 10 over the next few weeks or months. I don't know. <laughs> Never know anymore. As long as God wants to. I guess as long as God's in control. And, and what our new series is, we're in a new series now. Our new series is called The New Covenant. We're going to look at at how important the new covenant is, we're going to look at certain doctrines under the new covenant that are very important. But you and I live under the old covenant, not the, uh, the new covenant, not the old covenant. And, and it's kind of interesting the way Hebrews 8, 8, 9, and 10 is a section of its own dealing with the new covenant. And, and the whole idea of the book of Hebrews, the first 10 chapters of Hebrews is all about the superiority of Jesus Christ is superior over angels, over Moses, over sacrifices, Old Test, uh, Old Covenant, all of that. And so when you get to the, and chapters 5 through 7, he is, he is uh, superior to the Levitical priesthood. The, he, he brings in, in the New Covenant, a whole new priesthood is introduced. We live under a whole different priesthood than ever before. And... Um, so in, in chapters 5, 6, and 7, he introduces the priesthood, the superiority of the priesthood. And then in chapters 8, 9, and 10, he introduces the superiority of covenants. The new covenant is superior to the old covenant. And so it's kind of interesting the way he introduces this new section, chapters 8, 9, and 10. Look at verse 1. Uh, I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. Now the main point in what has been said is this. Well, uh, if you just jumped in like we just did, it requires backup study. I mean, he said the, the main point in what I've just said, you go like, what did you just say? And so that's chapters 5, 6, and 7. And it's about the superiority of the priesthood of Jesus Christ. And so he says, we have a high priesthood. The main point of what I'm bringing, the main point out of chapters 5, 6, and 7 into this subject to talk about a new covenant because the superiority of the priesthood that w the priesthood that every believer is under, 1 Peter 2, 5, and 9, every believer, that every person that believes the gospel that Christ died for their sins was buried and raised from the dead, every person who believes that for their salvation becomes a priest. Every believer is a priest in the church age. And what kind of priesthood is that? Was well, nothing like Levitical. Okay, and so he said the main point and what I what what we've just been discussing. I'm pulling the main point there, which was the high priesthood. Look at this: we have a high priest. See, that's the main point of the of the superiority of the priesthoods. We have such a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, right? Five, five, six, and seven after the order. Of, you know, you got to do. You know, if you jump in the middle of a book, you you know, owe it to yourself to see what the rest of the book's been talking about. Uh, we have a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. Now, who, who is that high priest? Only one person I know. That would be the Lord Jesus Christ, who ascended back to the Father and is seated at the right hand of God the Father. And look at, he introduces us to the idea of majesty, the throne of majesty, which is, which is supreme. It, it Not only is the priesthood superior, listen to me now, it is supreme. Now, I guess that's a step higher than superior. Okay. That's quite a priesthood we, we're under. But nothing's been like it. A minister in the sanctuary and in the true tabernacle, which uh, the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. For every high priest is appointed to, in other words, his high priesthood is in heaven. Ours is on earth. Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifice. Hence, it is necessary that this high priest also have something to offer. 
Now, if he were on earth, of course, he's in heaven, he would be a priest. He would not be a priest at all because he's from the tribe of Judah and the priest of Levitical is from Levi. Since there are those who offer gifts according to the law, who serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things, just as Moses was warned by God when he was about to erect the tabernacle for see, he says, that you make all things according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. In other words, the tabernacle of shadow Christology and the temple of shadow Christology was built off from the blueprint that was given from heaven to earth. And that blueprint was about Jesus Christ. Let's see, was that verse 5? Yeah, that's verse 5. That's far as I want to go with that. We're going to focus on the attention tonight. Our focus is on the session of Jesus Christ. He comes in the world. He dies on a cross for our sins. He's buried and raised from the dead on the third day, right? Death, burial, resurrection. That equals the gospel. According to 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, the scriptures declare he died for our sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day according to the Old Testament scriptures. And when you believe that, according to Romans 1, 16, when you believe the gospel, the gospel has the power to save you. Saves everyone who believes. The gospel becomes personally engaged with the person who believes it, and they are saved. And they are saved and according to Ephesians 2, 8, 9, they are saved by grace. This is the principle of grace, the principle of grace. We are saved by grace. The work was done by Christ. The gift is ours, and that's grace. We are saved by grace through faith, believing by faith, and not of ourselves as a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Okay? That's what, that's what a person... That's what a person that's the whole involvement of being converted or saved. Okay? Now, he does that. He's raised from the dead. He's in a post-resurrection body. And in that resurrection state for 40 days, he's in post-resurrection appearances. And then he ascends back to the Father seated at the right hand of God the Father, and we call that session. Death on the cross, burial, resurrection, 40 days of post-resurrection appearances. He goes back to the Father. He is seated in session, and then Pentecost comes. Pentecost comes, and the church age, right there. That right there is what is called Jesus baptizing with the Holy Spirit. Okay, so that's where we are in our subject matter. G the, the session of Jesus Christ means that he is seated. They see that was in verse one. Look at verse one again, and then we'll, we'll have a word of prayer. We have a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Okay, that's Christ in session. And uh he introduces to us a new covenant, okay? And that's what 8, 9, and 10 is all about, Hebrews. It's all about a new covenant. When you, when you, when you study, look, it's not that they take you no time to study three chapters, 8, 9, and 10, right? You can do that in commercials. So take a look at those and, and pay attention to the change of covenants. That's discussed. The cha chapter 8, 9, and 10, the change of covenants. All right, let's have a word prayer. I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest. This is classroom etiquette. You're indwelt by the Holy Spirit, one of the eight works of the Holy Spirit, the point of salvation. And the reason you need it in the in the in Bible study, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You gotta be spiritual. You can't be carnal. How do I know if I'm carnal? Identity of personal sin. Are you aware of any personal sin? It could be mental attitude sins. It could be sins of the tongue. It could be overt sins, mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue. 
those three categories at least. And if you're aware of it, then 1 John 1, 9 says, confess it. This is not for salvation, it's for sanctification. It's so that the ministry of the Holy Spirit can teach you the truth of the Word of God because that's what sets you free from bad decisions. It, it, he guides you, He teaches you, He, he leads you. And, he, and He's going to do it tonight in Bible study. This is where it's going to take root. So, Father, we thank you tonight for these that have come our way both by automobile and by the internet. And what we've said to our congregation as we've gathered here tonight, we say to those who are visiting with us on the internet, we require of you, if you don't have the ability to sit for the next 35, 40 minutes with us and study with us the truth of the Word of God, you, you might as well click off. You might as well click off. We don't have any commercials. You're going to have to sit still for 35, 40 minutes and click in with us and study the Word of God and let the Holy Spirit teach you. And so that's classroom etiquette for us. We would ask it of you here, and we ask it of you there. So I pray for that. I pray that you, you've you clicked in on us for a good reason. Stay with us and uh, study with us under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Confess sin if necessary. And study as a good, a good priest in the church age. For we've made our, our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you'll notice at the top of your paper, we're studying lessons on the New Covenant. Uh, if you have a, a special a book, you should put these in a special book. Some of you that went through the School of Biblical Theology, you have those books. This ought to be a, a special section in that book called the New Covenant, the Doctrines of the New Covenant. We'll look at many of them out of this study um, in Hebrews 8, 9, and 10. What we're going to learn is that the new covenant is superior to the old covenant. We're going to learn that the new covenant is absolutely 100% superior to the old covenant. And this is the claim that's made in both chapters 8, 9, and 10. He's going to say it, he's going to say it, and he's going to say it until you get it. A repetitive teacher. Okay? Now last week we studied the superiority of the new covenant priesthood of Jesus Christ, the priesthood that you and I are under, and not the Levitical priesthood. It is the priesthood of Jesus Christ. Ours is called the New Covenant priesthood. And it's important that you know that, because listen, we're all police. Look, it, it, it surprises young people to learn that when they got saved, 8, 9, 10, they entered the priesthood. Now, the priesthood entered them, I suppose you could say. And at some point, and listen, I have young people, kids that come out of camp, and they'll go like, Pastor Ron, you mean, you, can I be a priest? I said, well, listen, do you believe that Jesus died for your sins? Was buried and raised from the dead third day in order to give you salvation? Yes, sir. You really believe that? Yes, sir, I really do believe that. Then you're a priest. You were born into a priesthood. You were born again into a priesthood. So it's, it, it's not based on reaching a certain age. It is not rate based on going through a school of some sort in order to be a priest. Right? I mean, in, under the old covenant, you had to be born into the tribe of Levi. Then you had to go through schooling. It depended on what, where you worked in the temple or how you worked in the temple. You had to go through schooling. I mean, you didn't just, you become a priest at the point of salvation. Boom, there you are. It amazes me that more people are not interested in who they are in Christ. It, it surprises me. I mean, when I heard that, I began digging into everything, everything I could learn about the new priesthood, the new covenant priest. I mean, if I, if I am one, I don't know what, What's expected of me? And a, a, a good church like, like the one you're in tonight uh, works really hard to teach that to you. And that's why we're doing this study. Hmm? You know, I tell my, my grandkids this all the time. When we gather, I, I said, I'd like to have a gathering of the priest. We'll meet at 2 o'clock. Those who don't show up don't know what I'm talking about, so I have... I go talk to them privately. But everybody else that understands priesthood, they all show up. 
I'll have a meeting at two with the priest. Okay? And it, it's fun to see these little kids, 10, 10, 11 years old. I say little kids, you know, they're not little in their mind. Just a mind. Who show up? They show up and they got their little priesthood smile. Sitting there with people of 40, 50, 100. If they're not 100, they feel like it. It's just a wonderful, it's a wonderful concept, don't you think? It's a wonderful concept. So I use it when I talk to my kids. I use that. I use, I use biblical language. Does that surprise you that I might use biblical language with my family? Don't just use Southern talk. Although I do use some. Well, anyhow, I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about four things tonight about the importance of the session of Christ. That's new covenant stuff. Session of Christ is, there's two things that make our priesthood important. Uh, one is that it's new covenant, and the other is Melchizedek, remember? And we've talked about that. So here's the first point. The church of Jesus Christ operates under the new covenant, not the old covenant. That's amazing to me. You know, Christian churches think they can, they can walk this line. They one foot in the old covenant and one foot in the new covenant and can do both of these. You cannot do both. What, listen, it takes both feet to get through the new covenant. It takes both feet to get through the old covenant. You can't have one foot in the old covenant and one foot in the new covenant and straddle this thing and think you're doing it. That's crazy stuff. It's, we're not under law. We're under grace. You can't, you can't have one foot in law and the other in grace. I can't tell you how many Christian churches do that foolishness. Well, here, here, listen to this one. Here's Romans 8, 13. Where we're, that's the last verse of that chapter. We're headed there. <laughs> we only got the five, but we're headed there. And here's what it says. And when, and when he said, a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Now think about that. He has made the first obsolete. Whatever is becoming obsolete is growing old and is ready to disappear. That's when he wrote Hebrews. In other words, he said the old covenant is soon going to vanish. The word disappear means to vanish. Do you know what he's talking about? Tell me what he's talking about. 70 AD. He's talking about the fifth cycle of the divine discipline is going to take that whole Jewish system completely out brick by brick. And, and if that didn't work, then he ran them out of town, didn't he? In chapter 8, it didn't work, so he ran them out of town. He dispersed them abroad. A new covenant, he's made the first obsolete. Now let me show you something about this. Made obsolete is the verb. P-A-L-A, I don't think I wrote this on your paper. Did I write P-A-L-A-I-O-O? P-A-L-A-I-O-O? Okay, well, P-A-L-A-I, if you're interested, P-A-L-A-I-O-O. -O. This is where you get the word uh, paleology, and it's dealing, dealing with things like anthropology. It's the study of, of how things lasted for such a long time and what's the history behind them. Paleology. But what's interesting about this verb, and that's the word made obsolete, because there's a definite article with the word the first. O often the old covenant is called the old covenant, and sometimes it's called first covenant. Here he talks about the first covenant, old. <laughs> he made the first obsolete. And listen to why this verb is important. It's a perfect active indicative. Now listen to me. Perfect active indicative. The perfect tense is it means that it was completed in the past or the results, it remains completed this way forever. Obsolete. And obsolete and, and perfect tense before it's become completed, right? It's about to disappear. It's about to be there. It's aging and about to be there. See, this word paling means that, th that we're dealing with something that's really old. This goes all the way back to Moses, 15th century B.C., we're talking about something that's very old and has endured up to this point, and we're now at the end of that. 
it is about to vanish. Uh, the perfect tense means that when, when it finally comes to that point when it's done, it's in the process of being done right now. When that comes, it is gone. It is gone. The first obsolete, it's in a process, old in duration. He has made the first obsolete, and, there, and so he says, now, you know the principle, whatever is becoming obsolete and aging, remember that word growing old, we just did a study on aging and growing old, and that word in the Greek language for that is old, and old is ready to disappear, to vanish. And what's interesting in the Greek language about this word disappearing, it has an alpha privative on the front of this word. An alpha privative. On the front of it, it, has, it, it means to, it means, it's a word, the, the root of this word means to appear. You add alpha on the front of it, that's a negative, that's a minus. So it becomes disappear. Well, when you put the A in the front, now it changes the word to disappear rather than to appear. The second thing that's interesting about this word is it, it puts a suffix, M-O-S, on it. In the Greek language, when you put a suffix, M-O-S, or something else, it gives it a twist. It gives a very important twist to its meaning. And it means, it means action, the action or the cause. Therefore, when, when the writer puts this word like that, it says, and ready to disappear. Ready to disappear is what this means. It means pay attention to the cause or the action behind it disappearing. He, he, that's a key to us. It does like, look, there, now you, this is not a mystery. You know what's going to cause this. There is a decreed cause for the old covenant to be gone forever. See what I mean? That's an interesting word. It forces you to say that. We know what that is. That's the fifth cycle of divine discipline to the Jewish age for killing their Messiah. Right? Yeah, come on now. Well, it's just kind of an interesting, that, you know, that's one little old verse, but it's, that's the last verse of chapter 8. It's a pretty powerful verse, and it sets up as a bridge over to chapter 9 and 10. For those of us who are going there, <laughs> we're headed there. In the 10th chapter, verse 9, I'm just kind of giving you, uh, I'm trying to tease you to read chapters 8, 9, and 10 before you come to class. You know, that's understandable if you've ever gone to school, isn't it? Teachers should expect you to read the chapter before we discuss it in class. Is that sensible? Yeah, it would be. It would be. It'd be nice. It would help you. If you were going to be a, if you're going to get a test before the teacher taught it, when he got to class, said, when he get to school, he said, "I'm going to give you a test on the chapter, and then we'll study it." I have teachers like that. <laughs> then he said, "Behold, I've come to do your will." Here's chapter ten, verse nine. He said, "Behold, I've come." Talking about the Messiah, "Behold, I've come to do your will." He takes away the first to establish the second. You know what the key word is? To establish. He's going to take away the first in order to establish. The word establish in the, in the Greek language means to stand firm. It means to take a stand, to have it firmly planted. He's going to take away the first. He's going to take away the first so he can establish the second. What's he going to do with the first? He's going to do what? Oh, we're not going to keep it? Oh. Hmm. Well, isn't that interesting? We're going to take it away to do what? To establish the second, which is the new covenant. We're going to do what? Okay, I just want us to be sure that we know that. I mean, how many times do we have to do, say this to you before you believe it? Right? He's going to take it away, right?
When I went to college, I had a bicycle. Bicycle. Now, I didn't have to ride it from my house to the school because that was 250 miles away. But my parents didn't take it. I had to get a friend that was going that way, and he charged me to haul it. I was convinced my parents, if I wanted to go to college, my grandparents, here's the bike. Being worthy to go to college, I figured out a way to get it without riding it. As the first test of why it was important for me to go to college. If you're not smart enough to figure that out, son, maybe you ought to stay home on the farm. Oh, I know you think that's mean, but that was wonderful. My grandfather knew when I left for college I was going to be a smart kid. I wasn't a dummy. I figured out how to get that bike to Western Michigan University without pedaling it. The first sign of whether you're worthy to go to college of my grandpa's book. Well, anyhow, in the New Covenant Church of Jesus Christ, it operates under grace, not under law. Because we're going to do what with the law? We're going, to do, we're going to do away with it, right? We're going to take it away to establish the second. The new covenant operates under grace, doesn't operate under law. It's not, a, it's not a little bit of grace and a lot of law. It's not a lot of grace and a little law. It's grace without the law. Hello? You have no idea how many people just clicked off from me on the Internet. Now I'm, back, now I'm down to the real people. People that actually rode their bike here. Would you went to college if you'd had to ride a bike 250 miles? That's how bad I wanted to go to college. Actually, that's how bad I wanted to get off the farm. <laughs> I'd have pushed that bike. Got to push that bike. But well, anyhow, listen to Galatians 2.21. This, Paul, Paul understood this. He said, I do not nullify the grace of God. Boy, that's a strong word, nullify. I do not nullify the grace of God. Say, that's possible. He says, because if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. Well, that's about as strong as you can get on that subject. That's how strong Paul believed about it. The New Covenant Church has two ordinances. I mean, you can find this everywhere. I mean, the two common ordinances that all churches have. Now, a lot of times they have more. But the two common ones under the New Covenant is water baptism and the Eucharist. And you know what the Eucharist says? You should say it when you baptize. This is a baptism of the New Covenant. Water baptism is a baptism of the new covenant, which introduces you. How can you walk newness of life if it's based on water? <laughs> you can walk cleaner, maybe. <laughs> it talks, listen, water baptism is a visual aid of the coming of the Holy Spirit. Walking at this at Romans 6, 3 and 4 idea of identity with Christ and walk in newness of life. You know how you walk in newness of life? By the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what water baptism should teach you. Like in Matthew 28. 18 through 20. And the Eucharist says it doesn't it. It says this is the cup of the. New covenant. And it's the cup of the old. Cup of the new. And you know what's interesting to me. None of the seven great. Old covenant Levitical priesthood holidays. Are ever exercised. In the church. I'm not commanded to do them. You know why? They've all been fulfilled. Go ahead and check that, Gary. That door locks. Uh, the seventh, nah, he's all right. If he, if he hollers, we'll go. 
the, the seven great holidays, the seven great holidays under the old covenant, the seven great holidays under the old covenant out of Leviticus 23. We're, we have nothing to do with them. They're all fulfilled through Jesus Christ, either in his first. All seven covenants are based on his first coming and second coming, all of them. Point number two. I wonder if other people, I wonder if other churches are, are like ours. We get some, we get, we have some of the most interesting things happen to us. I suppose they are. I don't know. I just live in this one. Point number two, the ascension session. I mean, he's got to leave the earth to go to heaven. The ascension session of Jesus Christ verifies, now listen to me, this is important, verifies the claim that Jesus Christ ascended back to where he came from. Where do you think Jesus came from? Oh, you say Mary's womb? No, I mean, before then. <laughs> right? It came from heaven. And, and I gave you some scriptures. These were real interesting reading. Uh, John, for example, John 6, uh, 62. John 6, 62. Good thing it wasn't John. You, and listen, you want interesting read? Read John 6, 6, 6. There is a John 6, 6, 6. Well, anyhow. Uh, John 7, 33 would be interesting reading. John 14, 25 through 21, uh, 29. He says, I'm going back to where I came from. I'm going back to my father. I'm going back to where I came from. We know we can't do that. Nicodemus told us that, didn't he? See, Nicodemus said, I can't go back to where I came from. Well, that'd be interesting reading for you too in John 3rd chapter if you wanted some interesting reading. In John 3.13, he says, No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven. Ascending back to heaven, we call that the ascension. And when he gets there, we call that session. He's in session today at the right hand of God the Father or the, uh, the majesty on high. You can read this also in John the 6th chapter 33, 41, 50, and 58. Beats television. Really does. Read the Word of God. When you get to heaven, there won't be no TV, but there will be a Bible. It's the eternal Word of God. You're not promised a TV, not even in this life, but you are promised the Bible in heaven. So you might as well learn it while you're here. Be a smart kid when you go there. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, watch this. I love this part. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you. Now, we know how important that is, right? We've just done a long study on this idea. Truly, truly, I say to you that when he says that, he's pu pushing a very important messianic doctrine that was important to the closing down of the old covenant and opening up the new covenant. He says, truly, truly, I say, he who believes in me, the work, the work that I do, he's talking about his work on earth, the work that I do, he will do also and greater works are you kidding me? That's something. You know why it's greater work? Because the Holy Spirit comes and indwells every believer in the church age. Think how, how crazy that sounds to the average person. Indwells us as a whole person, not we get a little bit. Well, the, listen, here's the Holy Spirit. We'll give everybody a little bit so everybody has something. The whole person indwells every person. Look. That's enough to keep you up at night thinking about something, right? Well, apparently not many of you, but some. Mind-boggling? Mind yeah, I guess we could say that's mind-boggling. It is to me. He who believes in me, he who believes in me, the, the work that I do, listen to me, he will do also and greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. Oh, if Jesus lived here and I could follow him, oh, what great things I could do. Oh, no. When he leaves, you'll do greater things. Think about that. See, a lot of, a lot of pastors would be, would be glad if they could get you just to do a little work. 
will work till Jesus comes will work. If he could just get you to do that. But he would shortchange it. Well, listen, I was called to preach. I wasn't called to sing. I saw you grade me. But every once in a while, the song just has to come out. It's not always religious singing, but a song comes sometimes come out. Because I go to the Father. You'll do greater works because I go to the Father. I tell you, and it's an amazing thing to be part of a church that does the greater works. I am blessed. I've been to churches that didn't do any work. <laughs> oh, do, do my work. They do. Well, I ain't doing no work. That ain't this church. I tell you, that is not this church. And you know where he said that? Look, John 14, 12. John 14, 12. You know what he's in? He's at the upper room discourse, and is this heavy discussion on the Holy Spirit coming. John 14, 15, 16. Heavy, heavy, heavy. That's worth reading, too. Strange how everything's worth reading in it. <laughs> and, uh, I, I love the Bible, man. I love the Bible. I can't believe there was a day in my life when I didn't believe in God nor the Bible. I mean, it's just hard for me to believe that. That's the power of the rebirth life. I can remember every day when I go, you don't believe that stupid thing, do you? One book trumps every book in the library? <laughs> I don't think so. I didn't ride my bicycle to college. You know, you know, to be told there's only one book worth reading. I believe that today, though. I don't say, I'm not saying you shouldn't read some of the others, especially if you want a diploma. You don't want to get these worldly degrees, but I don't know. Point three. Session. The session of Jesus Christ shows divine except that I, I think this is really important theologically. Listen, session shows divine acceptance of the resurrected humanity of Jesus Christ after the purification of sin. When you just think about the Son of God, who he who knew no sin became sin for me on my behalf, that I might be made the righteousness of God in him. Second Corinthians 5. That is a powerful idea. And I often wondered after I was saved, well, if he took my sin and became sinful, how, how could he get back in the Father's favor? And he just I just told you, didn't I? Listen to this. Here's Hebrews 1.3. Oh, I love Hebrews 1. I love them all. It says, talking about Jesus Christ, listen to what he says. He says, he is the radiance of God's glory. He's the radiance of God's glory. If you've met Christ, if you met him in the flesh, you met God. You know, you see people, they'll meet somebody and say, gee, what you look like your dad? Right? Or, gee whiz, you look like your mother. Billy gets that a lot. The, the people say, and I, I, I go into a, a cleaners where we both go, and they get, our, they get our stuff mixed up. And I tell them, oh, I love you. <laughs> you have no idea how much I love you. And sometimes I'll go and I said, uh, they'll go like, uh, this straight, I must have died, Billy. And then, oh, yeah, well, here you go. But he likes it. Sometimes I actually favor his, so he likes that. He's a radiant. He, he, Jesus Christ, the humanity of Christ, is a radiance of God's glory. Listen to me. And the exact representation of his nature. I mean, who even thinks about God with a nature? We think of God with glory. But who thinks of God with the uh, Nature. And Jesus said it in John 10, 30, that, you know, that passage in there where he said, the Father and I are one. If you've seen one, you've seen the other. He said, nobody has seen God if you, if you take a good look at him. Now, that's a pretty powerful idea, don't you think? L listen, people miss this idea. They, don't, they get, oh, he is the radiance of his glory. But they miss this idea, the exact representation of his nature and, of course, we, we call that what? The essence of God, don't we? 
when we talk about the nature of God, we call it the essence of God. So theologically, that makes a lot of sense. And upholds all things by the power of, of uh, by the word of his power. No. And upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, that's cleansing. I mean, that's, that's listen, you, this word purification, it is the word cleansing, but it means cleansing from God's viewpoint. Not for human viewpoint, from God's viewpoint. When, God, when you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, God says, cleanse from all your sins. God says that. Purification is a right that God gives us, not man. That's a pretty powerful idea. Purify, cleanse from your sin. Because he who knew no sin became sin for us that we could be made the righteousness of God in him. I mean, is that not a powerful idea? Hmm. Propitiation did it. But listen, there, there are nine works that we celebrate in the blood of the cup of the Eucharist. Yeah, yes. And it said when, he, when or after he made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. That's Hebrews 1, 3. And we read it again in Hebrews 8, 1. Did we not? The majesty on high. Um, here's one. Hebrews 10, 12. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sin, watch this now, for all times. See, you could do that in the Old Testament. Every year, every year, every year, after year, every year, every year. Why are we doing this every year, Daddy? Because we're waiting on Christ to come, so we don't have to do it every year. This is a, an awakening of our souls that the Messiah is not here. The Messiah is coming. We don't offer those sacrifices anymore. We say the Messiah is coming, but my salvation is secure. Right? I mean, we're looking for a whole different ball game. You know, Hebrews, Hebrews 9, chapter 27 is what we're looking for. He comes a second time, not in regard to salvation, but yet involves deliverance. Okay, tonight you're making me work, aren't you? That's all right. That's why I make these big bucks. Here's point four. Oh, I can hear you saying hooray. I can hear it. It's, it's very low, but I can hear it. Here's my final point. It covers half a sheet of paper. But here's my final point. The session of Jesus Christ is described as seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty on high. You say, well, Ron, how, what, how's this session? Well, here it is. Here is, an, I, here is the, a definition of it. Seated at the right, session, ascension session. You hear people say that all the time in theology. Seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty on high. Um, 2 Peter 1.17 would be a good reference for you. But listen to this. And so I want you to put your eyes on it. Would you go to Psalms 110? I just, I just want you to find Psalms. Psalms, about the middle of your book, of your Bible. Psalms 110, 110, 1. 110, 1. This quote a great deal, and we're going to talk about this a little bit in point four. The Lord says to my Lord, nobody understood until Jesus came. You know what, you know what the, the theological do, Jew thought this meant? I want you to see something. In your English Bible, they did something wonderful. The word Lord in verse 1 is used twice. Agreed? Both times the word Lord is capital, and it is meant to be in, in, in this verse. Do you understand that? Is it not doubled? You know, it's the Jews, the theological Jews, 
thought that the second L was a small L and thought it referred to David. Because that was the covenant father, the father covenant. David, he was to set, the Messiah would come from the tribe of Judah and set on the throne, right? He would be the king of kings and the Lord of lords. I'll show you that in a moment. But it's important you put your eyes on what is that? The Lord, capital L, said to the Lord, capital L. Now, either he's talking to himself like many a times we do. <laughs> right? Can I encourage you that when you talk to yourself and you do all the time, right? You're talking to yourself now while I'm talking to you. As soon as I said, and if I was to say don't do it, you'd be sure to do it, right? I mean, it's just the way the flesh is. Include the other person in your life that's most important to talk to the Lord. Stop talking to yourself alone. You're going to get in trouble. Because the other guy in there, he's a dummy. He'll get you more trouble than you can imagine. You talk to him all day long, you get in trouble by the end of the day. I don't care if you're in school or home. So when you start talking to yourself, include the Lord, because that's who's actually there if you're born again. Right? He'll help you. Good thing about it, you can't change the channel. You can stop talking, but it ain't going anywhere. Well, the Lord said to my Lord, watch what he said. Sit at my right hand. Oh, geez, I think I know who that other L is. I believe it's the Lord God speaking to the Lord's son. What do you think? The Lord said to the Lord. See, sometimes we read the Bible and don't read it. We got a double L here. Sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies a footstool for thy feet. He's talking about the first coming and the second of Christ, but they didn't talk that way in the Old Testament, did they? They talked only about one coming. But I tell you where the conversation is, the Lord to the Lord. Jesus even had to learn what I just taught you. Don't talk to yourself. Talk to the Lord. That's why he's there. That's why the Lord lives in your life. Through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, he is there for you to have a divine conversation and be connected with heaven. Well, anyhow, set up my right hand. Now, let's, let me go back to my paper. The Lord says to my, I know I wrote it, but I want you to put your eyes on it. The Lord said to my Lord, set up my right hand until... I make your enemies a footstool. We know that the footstool connected with the Lord comes after he's seated. So there's two parts to this. There's a part before he's seated and a part after he's seated. Agreed? The Lord said to my Lord, there's some things we have to do. We've got to go to the cross. We've got to be buried and raised from the dead. Before we set on our cross, once I mean set on uh, the throne, once I set on the throne, then Operation Footstool will come into being, right? But we've got a job to be done before we, that job comes into focus. Do you see what I'm saying? Why they missed this, I have no idea, but they missed it. We could, listen, because you have to think about Christ to get this passage. So, Operation footstool, the big deal is until. The Lord said to my Lord, set up my right hand until I make your enemies, uh, your enemies, a footstool for your feet. So what we have here, session, is going to take us to the second coming and Operation footstool, which deals with the angelic kingdom. Agreed? The angelic kingdom. That's why the writer of Hebrews, when he opens this up in chapter 1 and 2, he talks about the superiority of Christ to angels. He starts, his, the book of Hebrews starts off that way. Second chapter, boy, is really interesting reading on that subject. The Pharisees, watch this in Matthew. Go to Matthew. 
Let's show you this. I said that this is how the Jews, they didn't see this this way. I want you to go to Matthew with me. Put your eyes in Matthew. Matthew 22. Matthew 22. Uh, the Pharisees asked Jesus a question in um, 34 through 40. They asked him a question. 34. When the Pharisees heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they gathered themselves together. Uh, this is like a football team. Uh, you know, well, they lost, but we, we can win. If we can win, we can, we can, we can kill two with one, burn, with one stone. I mean, he just, he just whipped the, the Sadducees. So if we whip him, we'll get the title. <laughs> I mean, this is when dumb becomes stupid. So they gathered together, and they, they sent a lawyer to ask them the question to test him. See, they're looking, they're looking to get the title. Teacher, what is the greatest command in the law? He said to them, love the, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your strength, all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. Second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's old covenant thinking. On uh, these two commands depend the whole law and the prophets. That's old covenant. When he says, when he says the law and the prophets, he's talking about the entire what we call the Old Testament. He's talking about the whole shoot match. Okay. Now watch verse forty-one. Now while the Pharisees were gathered, gathered, Jesus asked them a question. Oh, now this is going to get interesting. Hmm. He counter, he gave him a counter question. You always pay attention. When somebody asks Jesus a question, pay attention to the counter question. And you will learn how to debate. Counter, here's a counter question. Now, while the fall, fallacies were gathered together, Jesus asked him a question. He asked, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? Now, you would have thought, if there was ever a gate question, there would be one. You, you would, Listen, you could ask the little kids downstairs. They could tell you the absolute truth in this church. Whose son is he? They said, the son of David. That's not a wrong answer. It's not the right one. Agreed? It's not a wrong answer. It's not the right one. They said to him, uh, he said to them, then how does David, see, he knew this. He knew their wacky theology. So he says to them, then how does David in the spirit, what does he mean by that? means that David wrote this as inspired scripture by the Holy Spirit of God in the Old Testament. That's how you that's how you can read it. He said to them, then how does David in the spirit call him Lord with a capital L? I mean, how did David get that status? How could how could, did David, listen gentlemen, did David ever reach the status of equality with the divinity of God? <laughs> well, he might have. Oh, I think maybe Bathsheba might have stood in the way of that deal. <laughs> I'm just thinking. <laughs> And then he says, Psalms 110.1. But you see, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put thine enemies under your feet. If David then called him Lord, how was it his son? No one was able to answer him a word, nor did anyone dare from that day, day on to ask him any more questions. How about that? 
wouldn't that be a good counter question? Way to solve so all that stuff. You, you're always asking me these stupid questions, and all you want to do is fight. You solve that. Well, anyhow, anyhow. Here's another reading for you. Psalms 110.1 was quoted by Peter at Pentecost. We're not going to look at it, but I'm just putting it out there for you. Psalms 100, 110 verse 1 was quoted by Peter at Pentecost in correlation to Jesus' baptizing uh, with the Holy Spirit. Acts 2, 33 through 36. And he tells you, Peter tells you, that that promise was connected to Psalms uh, uh, for the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. That's Jesus' baptism of the Holy Spirit. Paul outlines this divine authority that Jesus has in session and how it affects our life. And listen to me, in Ephesians 1, 19 through 23, 3, and you know what he calls it? He calls, he says that every church age believer has access, now watch this, has access to the throne of God's grace, right? Hebrews 4, 16, right? Oh, please, boy, put that verse down if you don't have it in your hip pocket. Be sure to have that in access. But listen, he says, every church age believer, because they're in union with Christ, seated at his right hand of God the Father, right? We are baptized into Christ. We're a new creature, creature in Christ. Listen, he says, as a result of that, every church age believer, watch this now, has access to the, watch this now, to the surpassing greatness of his power. <laughs> I mean, just having access to his power would be something, wouldn't it? He's talking about his divine authority or, or, or that you have access. You have access to the divine authority of Jesus Christ. See the right hand of God the Father. And listen, he doesn't just call it a power. He calls it the surpassing. Did you hear that? The surpassing greatness of his power. And that's to your, you have access to that. While he's in session at the right hand of God the Father, he can work in your life the surpassing greatness of his power, of his authority power. For example, 1 John 4, 4, greater is he who is in you, indwelling Holy Spirit, than he who is in the world, the devil himself. I mean, we whine about stuff that we shouldn't be whining about in the Christian life. We whine about more stuff in the Christian life. All that whining shows that you don't understand that you have access to the surpassing greatness of the power of God in Christ. You have access to that because you're in union with that authority. Colossians 3. Therefore, if, first class condition is true, therefore, if you have been raised with Christ and you have, but the principle, the doctrine of principle is what he's emphasizing, keep seeking, that's an imperative, that's a command, keep seeking things above while your feet are on earth. Seeking the things above where Christ is seated at, that should be right hand, not the fight hand. I mean, apparently his right hand is pretty powerful. Seated at the right hand of God, then he tells you a sec gives you a second command. Now, the first command was what? I'm not letting you out. Seeking. Right? Seeking. That was a command. Now he gives you a second command. Set your mind. Seek. Watch that sound. Keep seeking things above where Christ is seated around. Why? Because you have, you have access to the surpassing greatness of the power of Christ in your life today with your feet on earth. And we sit around and whine and cry, I can't, I can't. you go like, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? Why aren't you tapping in? It shows when you do all that, it shows that you are not tapping in to the surpassing greatness. And, and, and listen, you have that access of power through the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. You walk by the Spirit and you walk by faith. This is how this power works in your life.
It's not going to work just because you say, well, you know, I have a Bible. Ah, well, you should read it. Well, I, I, I go to church. Well, you should study. You should go to church to study, not just to attend. Because this, these are the sources of access to the surpassing greatness of the power of God. Right? Must be speaking to somebody at home in the internet. Now listen to me what I'm telling you. Set your mind on things above. That's the second time I've been told to do that, right? What's the first time I was told to do? Seek things above. Now I'm told to set my mind on them. Seek them when you find them. Put your mind on it. Put your mind on the things you're taught that will bring you into the surpassing greatness of the power of God in your life. We, we today are so weak and mealy-mouthed in the church. Well, I've got this problem. What can I do? Well, you probably could do this or you could do that or you could do this or you could do that. You got this. Stop. All you've done is confuse me. We don't have any answers. Listen to this one. 2 Corinthians 5.10. For we, church age believers, must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now listen to what he says. So that each one of us may, so, so that each one may be uh, re recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what is done, whether good or bad. I mean, who, who's keeping account? Well, your, your mom and dad. <laughs> uh, and the Lord. And you know why? It's not so that he can deal with the good and the bad and the ugly. Listen, he can take care of it now, not later. Take care of it now. Take care of it now. Take care of it right now. Because there's going to come that judgment seat of Christ one day. Listen, that's not the point. The point is take care of it now. Work on, work on it now. Don't stay in the bad. When the bad, when the bad situation is there, correct it. Right? Correct that. Correct it. You have the right. Listen. Do you, do you not have access to the surpassing greatness of the power of Christ? Please tell me you know that by now. Well, anyhow, you can read the rest. I'm out of time. Let's see, tomorrow night, I finish up the other, I've got one more study on Wednesday night, and then we'll, we'll move into a different area. Um... Uh, the baptism of fire. I'm dealing that the Jesus baptizing with fire. This is part two, and then we'll be through with that series, and we'll start a new series. My new series on Wednesday night, not 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 this Wednesday, but the next Wednesday. I'm gonna I'm going to study the creation out of the book of Romans, eighth chapter. So you you'll find that I think maybe find that interesting at, from that approach. That Paul took. We're going to take that from Paul's approach. Uh, let's have a word of prayer. and We'll dismiss that. And uh, and then some of you have to leave. Uh, like Wayne's got to leave. Because he's got family stuff. Business. And he's got to get back to it. And the rest of you that want to stay for prayer. Then you stay. We'll have private prayer. Our Father we thank you tonight. For these have attended with us. Both by automobile and by internet, and we pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God on the importance to our life, the fact that Jesus is seated at right hand of God the Father in heaven and, and the dynamics for my life today. It's not just He's there because I'm going. He's there because I need Him now. I need Him now. I need that authority, and I have access to the surpassing greatness of the power of Christ today in my life because he sets in session with all authority. I am so thankful for that. And I pray that we would get that principle in our life and make our life more victorious on this side. And uh, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us.